Welcome to this episode of the Common Sense Skeptic. This episode started off as a portion of a viewer's question installment, but we came to the conclusion that it is probably worth its own segment of airtime, and we should make this clip very easy to find for everyone. You'll be happy to know we're going back to basics for this one, simple grade school math backed up by third-party articles to make sure everyone understands the answers we are providing. Several viewers and debaters from other sites have been promoting the idea of Starship using water as a shield against galactic cosmic rays, also known as GCRs. These are highly energetic particles, mainly protons, that originate from outside our solar system, but from within our galaxy from explosions so violent that these molecular nuclei have been stripped of their electrons, resulting in subatomic particles that can penetrate almost any object. In Episode 4, Ship's Conditions, we spent time going into detail how such radiation could possibly trigger a nasty bug already resident in everyone's system called the Epstein-Barr virus that can manifest itself as anything from cold sores to Hodgkin's lymphoma. And that's just one example of how radiation might affect astronauts or colonists going to Mars. A secondary radiation concern is solar radiation from our own sun, but that is a whole other ballgame that generates lesser concern and requires its own solutions. Where solar radiation on board a space vehicle can be blocked simply by putting heavy metals such as lead or mass such as cement in the way, GCRs tend to zip right through just about anything they come across. It takes our magnetic and also deadly Van Allen belts and the hydrogen in our atmosphere to diminish the effects that GCRs have on life on Earth. And still, many of those nuclei particles bombard Earth every day. The biggest thing to note with GCRs is that not only are they destructive on their own, but when they collide with other materials such as spaceship hulls made from aluminum, titanium, and stainless steel, these collisions release other particles that do additional damage to living tissues. In space, once a vehicle is away from the Van Allen belts, which are themselves deadly belts of energetic protons and electrons, it's going to get nailed with this high energetic radiation, whether Musk believes it or not. Musk is on record as saying on many occasions that radiation is not a huge concern for him, that every other scientist on the planet is making more out of this than is necessary. So it's doubtful he'll put very much thought into this at all. But you didn't touch much on how you will keep humans safe on the way over there from either deep space radiation or how they will live on the planet. Can you give, give us some insight into the life support systems, habitats, stuff like that? So I actually think the radiation thing is, is, is um, it's often brought up, but I think it's not, not uh, too big of a deal. The Scientific American put out an article in 2006 that was very in-depth and went through various solutions for the radiation they stated will rip apart one-third of your DNA for every year that you spend in space. Included in the article's solutions was a spherical habitation module that had to be surrounded by 5 meters, or about 16 feet, of water. Liquid water and organic waste do seem to be top contenders for GCR protection. Water ice, being less dense, has a lesser effect than liquid water. The small, simple water molecule isn't as easy for the GCR to pass through without colliding. So let's say the starships going to the moon and to Mars are going to envelop the crew compartment of the ship in a layer of water between a dual hull to protect the astronauts from this destructive radiation. We know the specs of Starship as presented on the SpaceX website, so we'll use those and we'll compare them to other concept diagrams to make the best case we can. For those people who are going to argue we are using artist concept renderings with no engineering competency behind them to work these numbers, you're right. And it doesn't matter, unless they change the dimensions of the ship. And even then, it won't matter. Starship, on the SpaceX website, has the declared specs of being 50 meters or 160 feet tall and 9 meters or 30 feet across. Propellant capacity is 1200 tons, payload capacity is only 100 tons, which is 110 tons in imperial weight. Comparing this wireframe diagram to one of the latest renders of Starship, we can see it's a fairly close match. As a quick side note, some people on various chat feeds have declared that we have the LOX and the CH4 tanks backwards, and that it is the cryogenic methane tank that occupies the upper chamber. As you can see from this SpaceX slide, that is not how it's presented, and really it makes sense to have the LOX closest to the living area should they happen to need extra oxygen in the cab. Here's how the diagram of the vehicle breaks down. The bottom 6.5 meters are the recessed engine housing. The combined propellant tanks take up the next 20.5 meters. Now the blue and pink areas represent the pressurized area of the vehicle. 
This section breaks down into a cylinder, 9 meters across, standing 11 and a half meters tall, upon which stands a tall, narrow, rounded cone standing another 12 meters tall. To make it simple, we'll round off the edges to make it a straight line between the bottom and the top, which will put our numbers on the very conservative side of things. So if we're going to use water to protect the crew, how much water are we going to require? We can work that out by subtracting the volume of the inner compartment from the volume of the outer hull. According to the May 2019 article on DukeWork.com, studies indicate that to reduce the radiation exposure by GCRs by half, they would require a water reservoir 2 meters thick surrounding the entire compartment. To cut this exposure down to 25%, they would need 3 meters. Obviously, this would create huge issues with the available living volume inside the craft, and therefore the number of crew capable of making the journey. Fact is, we can destroy this water argument using 25% of that requirement, where the water shell surrounding the ship will only be 50 centimeters, not 2 meters thick, providing almost no protection against radiation. We're going to ignore the minutiae, such as how thick is the insulation and how thick is the hull, and we're just going to get to the real meat of this. Volume of a cylinder is pi times radius squared times height, giving the lower cylinder a volume of 731 cubic meters. Volume of a cone is one third pi radius squared times height, giving the volume of the cone at 255 cubic meters, ignoring the convex curving of the craft. That's a total of 985 cubic meters. The claim that Musk makes of having 825 cubic meters of living space is in the ballpark. Now we work out the inner living chamber. Instead of a radius of 4.5 meters, the cylinder reduces to an even 4. The height reduces to 11. The volume reduces to 553 cubic meters. Instead of a radius of 4.5 meters, the cone reduces to a radius of 4 and the height reduces to 11.5, so the volume drops to 193 cubic meters. Total volume, 746 cubic meters. Subtracting the inner chamber from the outer chamber leaves the volume of water required for this shielding at 239 cubic meters. Water and the metric system have an amazing relationship with each other. One liter of water weighs one kilo. One thousand kilos weighs a ton. A ton of water measures one meter by one meter by one meter. So each cubic meter of water weighs one ton. Meaning the 50 centimeter thick wall of water surrounding the pressurized living compartment would weigh 239 tons. And the payload capacity of the entire ship is 100 tons. The next argument people will come up with would be that the 9 meter variation isn't meant to haul colonists. Musk is supposedly making a ship twice as large with an 18 meter diameter that will do that to give everyone more space. So we'll keep the rock at the same height and apply the 18 meter parameter to these equations to see where we wind up by doubling the radius only. We'll just stretch the compartment out by double. Radius of the cylinder now is 9 meters, the height still 11 and a half meters. Volume is 2,926 cubic meters. Radius of the cone is 9 meters, the height is 12 meters. Volume is 1,018 cubic meters. Now you take away the 50 centimeter gap. Radius of the inner cylinder is 8.5 meters, height is 11 meters, volume now 2,497 cubic meters. Radius of the inner cone is 8.5 meters, height is 11.5 meters. Volume is now 3,367 cubic meters. Difference in volume now is 577 cubic meters, or 577 tons. So the radius is two times the original ship, but the required water now is 2.41 times the volume. Now let's run those numbers again from the article using the two meter thickness of water required to drop the GCR radiation exposure in half. The interior cylinder measures a radius of seven meters with a height of nine and a half meters, and the cone measures seven meters radius and 10 meters high, giving a combined volume of 1,976 cubic meters. The difference is 1,968 cubic meters. So the weight of that water would be almost two kilotons to only reduce the amount of radiation by half. If they were to attempt the two meter water barrier on the nine meter diameter Starship, not only would the interior volume drop to a little over 250 cubic meters, suitable for no more than 10 crew members, but the water would weigh over 730 tons. Conversation threads are full of throwaway panacea solutions, such as nuclear power to solve all the power shortcomings of a Mars colony, robot builders to get the colonists' living quarters together before they even arrive, 
vertical farming as we described in our last episode. And this claim was right in there with them, using water to protect colonists from the deadly radiation that permeates outer space. But as we've demonstrated, water will not be the solution that they're looking for because the amount of water required outweighs the payload capacity of the vehicle. So as far as we're concerned, that claim is all washed up. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of The Common Sense Skeptic. Tomorrow or sometime over the weekend, we're expecting Musk to launch Starship SN8 from Boca Chica, Texas, or at least try to. Our subscribers have been participating in a poll trying to prognosticate when the fireball is going to happen, so we'll produce a quick big net after the ship blows up to see who got it right. Get your vote in on our community page, give this video a like, and hit subscribe so you'll know when The Common Sense Skeptic returns.